Well, thank you, Pastor Greg. I, I first just want to say uh, thank you to your great pastors, Matt and Bobby. You have the best around. I can verify that. You have the very best around. They are a blessing to me and Holly. Uh, secondly, I just want to say the culture of hospitality and excellence from this staff, both paid and unpaid. How many realize there's a lot of unpaid staff around this place? Their, their reward may not be right here in monetary means, but they are building up a storehouse in heaven. Can you give this team a hand? They have done a wonderful job. It, it, it is always such an honor to come to Fellowship of Praise and to worship the Lord with you. And I, I have a message that I want to bring to you today. And I want to preface and say that this message today may not be for you now. But if you just tuck this one on the shelf, eventually, at some point, sometime, you are going to need to go back and catalog this and re-listen or re-immerse yourself in what God is saying to us in this hour and in this moment. And I want to talk about the present work of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, the present work of the Holy Spirit. That's what I love about FOP. You are an audience participation church. Thank you for that. The present work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we think of the present work of the Holy Spirit, it is very easy to bring to mind the power of miracles. How many believe that God still does miracles in our hour? Yes, he does. It is also easy to bring to mind the might of deliverance, how with a right stretched arm and a strong hand, God has delivered and continues to deliver his people. It's easy to bring to presence of mind his manifestation through dynamic worship. And we went to old school church this morning. Wasn't that good? I love that. The the manifestation of the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost. But often overlooked in the current and the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our day is the work of the comforter. Somebody say comforter. Jesus said that one of the many roles of the church today is going to be operating in the fruit and the gift of the Holy Spirit, but also in the working of comfort. Turn with me to John chapter 14. I'm going to read this one out of the King James Version, uh, starting in verse 15, because it gives us this, this wonderful word that we can take and tuck away in our heart. Here's what it says. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, who's Jesus talking to there when he says, if you love me, Keep my commandments. Is he talking to the world outside? Is he talking to the whole wide world when he says, if you love me, keep my commandments? No, he's talking to those who have given believing loyalty to Yahweh. Those who have said yes to the claims of Christ on their life. And so he's talking to us. He's saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another, so everybody say it with me, comforter. He will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. (laughs) I will come to you. Now, Jesus is talking to believers here, and he prays the Father. He requests something on your behalf that you cannot gain on your own. There are some things that we can do on our own. And if we can do those things, then by God, we should do those things. Some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. They want to pray, oh Lord, should I do the dishes? Well, if the dishes are dirty, then do the dishes. There's certain things you really don't even have to have discernment or pray for. You just know, I need to activate my gift of servitude, and I need to do that. I need to involve myself there. But there are other things that Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he will send you something that you cannot access on your own. Some things you can't do by yourself. And he said, I will send you the spirit of truth. And you need the spirit of truth because when you're in pain, when you've gone through suffering, When you've experienced loss, when someone rubs you the wrong way, you need the spirit of truth because the enemy will lie to you, will deceive you, will get into your fickle feelings and cause you to get all consternated and upset and off base. And you can't even come into God's house and lift up hands without wrath and doubt because you have an ought against somebody. 
they probably don't even know you have a problem with them and it's hindering your worship. And that's why you need the spirit of truth. And it says the world, this antichrist system, cannot comprehend this. And it says that he dwells with you because Jesus was in their presence. But there is coming the day, and now it is, when the spirit of God dwells in us. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that the spirit of God dwells in you. Therefore, there is something on the inside that activates in the life of the believer. Now, I like this last part. He says that he will come to us. The first message of Jesus, when he spoke on the Galilean seaside, the first message of Jesus was heard by two apostles. They were just common men at that time. But John and Andrew heard a message from Jesus, and it was like this. Come and follow me. When they heard that, something activated on the inside. They obeyed and they went and they followed Jesus. And not only that, they were so excited about the message they had heard that they went and told others and they started following Jesus as well. So the first sermon, the first message you could say of Jesus was come and follow me. Yet in this, one of the very last messages of Jesus, he says this, I will come to you. So we have come to Jesus, but now he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In other words, you're no longer orphaned. You're not alone. There, it doesn't matter how lonely you feel. He said, I will come to you. I will comfort you. I will be with you. I will live on the inside of you. And so today for a few moments, I want to focus on comfort, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And the reason that we need comfort is because we are walking around and we are living in a sin-sick and broken world. A world that inflicts pain on each other. Just look at the world news and you can see that there is fighting and wars and rumors of wars and people trying to put someone else down so that they can get higher. And this is why God has given us this great comfort. In fact, if you look back into the scriptures, you know that there is an entire book called Lamentations. Lamentations comprises five poems. These poems are set in the backdrop of a people, the people of God, who had gained such popularity. They had gained such success, both national and religious success. They had built the world's most wonderful and elaborate temple. They had lived long enough to see all of their dreams realized. They had lived long enough to have such prosperity, to have such power and favor among people. They were the nation of nations. These people had achieved everything that, humanly speaking, you could desire or want in this world. Does that sound like the United States of America in 2023? But something happened when judgment came and destruction came and they lost the very thing that they prized the most. Their blessed and valued temple was destroyed. They were sent into exile and they entered into an entire season of life which is called lamenting. Everybody say lamenting. Lamenting is grief overturned again and again. Let me just read to you a couple of things from Lamentations. But first I want to tell you the Hebrew name for this book is not Lamentations, but it is the book of how. How? Have you ever asked, God, how did this happen? How did I end up here? Why has all of this turned another direction? This is what Lamentations offers to us in a response. Lamentations 1 and 2, uh, 1 and verse 1 says, How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She was great among the nations. She who was a princess among all the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all of her lovers is none to comfort her. All of her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Lamentations 2, the next poem says, I have cried until the tears no longer come. My heart is broken. You ever sat with someone who have been through such a tragedy and, and a trial and, and they're not even crying? And you may even wonder, why are they not crying? Well, all of their tears are gone. They have cried all that they can cry. My spirit is poured out in agony as I see the uh, desperate plight of my people. Little children, tiny babies are fainting and dying in the streets. This sounds like a dire time. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had a time where you cannot even find it in yourself to pray? 
There's not even a sense and an urgency of what you should ask for or how you should approach the throne of grace. You know God's available, but you just don't have the words. Or you're sitting beside someone who is so broken and so heart-rended that, that there's nothing that you can even feel like you can say that can comfort them. And if you've ever been in that place and the spirit of God lives on the inside of you, then you know that according to Romans 8, that there is something on the inside that, that the spirit of God will groan prayers that you can't even utter, that will pray through you. Sometimes it's just simply the ministry of presence, of being there when someone is in need, of lamenting and grieving in a godly way with people. Now, our, our society is very good at celebrations. We know how to party, don't we? Outside the church and inside the church. I mean, in my BC days before Christ, I, I knew how to party. I got in, in the church, I'm thinking, all oh, my partying days, I've had the best party in Jesus that I've ever had. We know how to party. Look at the calendar. You can see that there are dates and celebrations set aside for great parties and, and a time off and that we can celebrate. But we are not very good as a nation at lamenting. We are not very good as a people at mourning. We're not very godly when it comes to grieving oftentimes. And we in this life will grieve over two things, two areas. We grieve over things and people. Things, first of all, uh, there's actually a couple categories here. Things are possessions. We grieve over possessions like the loss of a home, the loss of a savings account, Maybe it was a retirement account or a bad investment went south and we grieve over that. Maybe it was that, that in the case of the Lamentations, they were grieving over a temple that was destroyed. So things, possessions can really break our heart. and We grieve over this. Also, we grieve over opportunities. Maybe we wish that we had continued our education. We had gone down that path of, of extra schooling, but now we feel like we can't even pursue that career because we don't have the pedigree. We, did, we didn't seize our opportunity. We grieve over opportunities that we miss. Maybe it was a promotion at work. Maybe it was uh, some kind of insight that we thought we could patent that idea, and, and lo and behold, somebody else finds some way to patent that. And we think, oh, why didn't I take that and seize up on that opportunity? We also grieve over dreams. These are goals that have never been fulfilled. Dreaming, but never really able to grasp it. it. Maybe it was future hopes. You had ambitions and aspirations, and it never really materialized. You find yourself at this place in life, and you think, I should be further than this. All of my contemporaries, it seems like everybody are further down the road than me. And we grieve over missed opportunities, over possessions, and over dreams. But maybe the deepest is that we grieve over people. We grieve over a broken and schismed relationship, a friendship that used to be our best and brightest and somehow it's no longer even a shell of what it used to be. Maybe even not even talking to people who are blood relatives to us. We grieve over the loss of friendships and over family and sometimes even over the physical earthly loss of a loved one, a parent, a spouse, a child. And in this celebratory kind of atmosphere we live, we are not really ever walked through the proper process of grief. And many times to our own peril, we don't ever access the comfort that God offers through the Holy Spirit. Now I wanna talk about David for just a few moments. We, most of us are familiar with David. This Old Testament figure is very complex. There, there are so many uh, seasons of David's life that you could peer upon, you could look into, and, and many that you can celebrate and others that you would just simply turn away from and say, I, just, I wish the authors would not have written that about my hero. How many realize that the Bible doesn't sanitize even your heroes? It's all in there. The good, the bad, the ugly, it's all in there. David certainly had his share of highs and lows, but David had an occasion to grieve. He certainly experienced loss. How so? Well, he experienced loss of things when he came upon the city of Ziklag when he was out to battle and he came back. His entire city had been plundered. Even his wives and children had been taken off to another place. He grieved not only the possessions, but also his family. Another occasion, David was 
in a delayal season of life when he was anointed to be king, but it took more than a decade before he actually came to the throne. And so he had the delay, that moment of, of waiting and, and patiently just believing the word of God and not knowing when it would come to place. And somebody in, the, in here today, you're probably in this time of, of already but not yet. You know that already you are called, you are anointed, you are appointed, but you have not yet gotten to that place where you can actually stand and you can minister or you can do the calling or you can have that position, that, that place where God has promised in your heart. And David knows knows what you're going through because for years and years he had a delay of the position that he was promised by God and he grieved over that opportunity that he was waiting to come to pass. David had such a deep rebellion once he was king in his own family that he thought I'll just pass this on to the, the next one and, and it'll go in the, the hierarchy line and the, the lineage of my family and he understood what it was like to have his dreams dashed when rebellion after rebellion and hearing in the back of his ear that the sword would never leave his home. Why? Because of things that he did himself. David had the occasion to grieve. And some people can relate with David because he lost a child at birth. He lost his best friend who was killed in battle. He had betrayal after betrayal of close alliances and people next to him. But maybe the worst and deepest stain on David's entire family was this occasion that we read in 2 Samuel 13. I'll go there in just a minute, but let me recap the story. Because there was a horrible incest that took place in David's family that resulted, hear this, in one of his sons killing another one of his sons. Not only a sibling rivalry, but a sibling murder and blatant disregard for the respect of his family. This tragic story is recorded in the book of Samuel. And we're told that King David's oldest son is named Amnon. And he became so infatuated with his half-sister Tamar. They, they uh, didn't have the same mother. That he concocted this plan that he would rape her. Besides the obvious shame that this brought upon the royal family, there was retribution that was in the works. Because David's other son, Absalom, who was the biological brother of Tamar, came to her defense, but in a very calculated and a very patient way. The patient wheels of justice started to turn in Absalom's mind, and he took matters into his own hands. He didn't immediately execute judgment upon his brother, but he waited a couple of years. You can read all this in 2 Samuel. He waited a couple of years, and what he decided to do was that he would throw a big party and invite all of his brothers. And when Amnon, his brother, who raped Tamar, his sister, when they were there and he was good and drunk at the party, Absalom would give the order that his soldiers and his men under his command would kill his older brother. And this is exactly what happened. He vindicated Tamar for the rape that was committed against her. But in so doing, he brought a scourge on the royal family, a mark on his own life, and a deep wound upon his father, David. When King David heard the news, you can only imagine that there were certain things running through his head. Number one was that he was privy unwittingly to setting the two up. He, he had to give the order for Tamar even to come into the room. You can read all of this. Listen, Hollywood can't write this as good as the Bible says. It's an amazing story. And also when David hears this, he has to have a little twinge of conscience that speaks up and says, David, you too had an indiscretion taking something that you shouldn't have taken. You too have modeled for your family something that you should not have done. And so this self-loathing, this self-shame started to come upon David. And you can understand why. I want to recap, uh, paraphrase 2 Samuel 13. It says, Then the king arose, tore his garment, and lay on the earth. And all of his servants who were sitting by tore their garments. Also the king and all of his servants wept bitterly. Everybody say, they wept bitterly. And David mourned for his son, how often? Every day. David mourned for his murdered son every day. And after three years, the king now reconciled to Ammon's death. He kind of grew uh, uh, understanding. He, he, he kind of came to grips with this. It says, now reconciled to Ammon's death, 
longed to be reunited with his son Absalom. Now this is amazing. Look at the power of parental love that we see in this verse. Look at the power of David desiring to be close once again with his son. But there are three things that we observe from this story about King David and about grief. Number one is that it says that he wept bitterly. Now, if you are going through something, if you are in the place of brokenness of heart, if you are in the place of grieving, then the Bible says it is absolutely understandable if you weep bitterly. The lamentation says they cried until they had no more tears. Don't let somebody else set your timetable for grief. Don't let somebody else tell you where you should be now in this process that you have lost something. Go to the word of God. And it says that David wept bitterly. He expressed how he felt to God. He allowed uh, the grief to flood over him. This is also the writer of so many of the imp- um, uh, imprecatory psalms that we know of. The psalms that, that we read in our versions are pretty clean. But if you read them in the Hebrew, they're, they're like basically cussing at God. Saying, God, why did you let this happen? How am I in this predicament? I thought you loved me, God. I thought you could hear my prayers. Why am I going through this? This is David who is pouring out his complaint to God. He is weeping bitterly. And if you're in that place and you're in that time, you need to know to express yourself to God. Listen, God has big shoulders. He can handle it. He already knows what you're thinking. You might as well go ahead and say it and pour it out. And it says that David mourned every day. We never find that David stopped mourning the death of his son. He says that he mourned every day. And that should tell all of us that there are some things in this life that you never get over. You will get through them with God's help, but you may never get over them. Don't let somebody come alongside you like one of Job's comforters and say, well, you just need to get over that. No, you may never, ever get over that. You may never forget what that day was like. You may never forget that moment. You may never forget what happened, but through God's grace, the comfort of the Holy Spirit can come over you and can do what God did for David. It says, David was comforted after years, three years, after years of pouring out his heart, of weeping bitterly, of mourning, of lamenting. It says, David was finally comforted. After a long period of time, he came to grips with his death. And look what happened, is that he desired reconciliation for the one son that was involved in this matter, which was still around. And there are some things that you can still do with situations that have happened to you. There are some people who are still around that you can now reconcile these relationships. You know, the human heart has a desire, an inner desire for reconciliation. We are wired that way. We desire reconciliation. You know, first and foremost, we desire reconciliation with God. Here's the good news. God is always open and willing and available to reconcile with us. If we'll but come to him and say, save me, Lord, a sinner. I repent. I turn around. I go the other direction. God is willing to reconcile with us. But unfortunately, people are not always willing to reconcile with you. David had no guarantees. He had no promises. Maybe Absalom, his son, didn't want to reconcile. He had ignored him for three years. You could understand if David was just a little bit tepid about wanting to reach out to this son who he had ignored for all these years. But it says he never stopped grieving his son, both Absalom and Amnon. There was a father's heart to want to reconcile. And so he went after that reconciliation. It's no wonder that only David could write these timeless and comforting words. In the Psalms, David says, yea, though I walk through. I don't sit down in, but yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David knew something about death that we need to absorb. Death is but a shadow. (laughs) My shadow, that shadow can't hurt you. That shadow has no power over you. David said, yeah, I'm going to walk through it. I'm going to be clouded by it. They might throw some shade on me. I might be shadowed by it, but I'm not sitting down there. I'm walking through. Some things I'm never going to get over, but I'm going through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because thy rod and thy staff, 
What do they do, church? They comfort me. Now, a rod is an offensive and defensive weapon. A rod was used in a skilled shepherd's hands to hurl towards the sheep that has gone astray and to hit into that rough and that brush so it would be startled enough to run back to the shepherd. A rod, they say, that when they would find that one that had strayed, that the shepherd would actually take the rod and gently break the leg of the sheep and lay it over the shoulders of the shepherd, not so that the sheep could never be healed again, but that the sheep could learn to trust in the shepherd, could get close to the heartbeat of the shepherd. And though it hurt for a season, joy came in the morning when it recognized that my shepherd loves me. I am the sheep of his pasture. And so this rod that is both an offensive and a defensive weapon that can cast at any of the enemies coming in, it comforts me. But the staff, the shepherd's staff, that's different. It wasn't used as a weapon at all. It was actually a designation of the occupation of the person holding it. For no other occupant, no other occupation had a staff. It was only for a shepherd. And a staff was used for loving direction, for alignment and redirection. A staff was used for management of the sheep. A staff was an instrument of comfort. I want to close with this if they'll come. Lamentations 3 says this, verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, God. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Apostle John closes out his gospel like this. Chapter 14, verse 25. These things have I spoken to you, being yet present with you. But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Jesus offers peace. Jesus offers hope. Jesus offers comfort. With heads bowed and no one looking around, maybe you're joining us online today and there's just something that continues to resonate in your mind. There's some loss, there's some grief, there's a pain, a sorrow that you've not yet felt comfort from. We as the believing community, filled with God's Holy Ghost power, are uniquely fit in fashion to offer comfort to those in a time of need. For it is God working in and through us to do his good pleasure. And if that's you today and there's a burden you need to lay down, if you need to stand in for someone that they're so hurt and they're so broken, they won't come to church, they won't walk an aisle, they won't come to a place of prayer because they're so burdened, then you can come for them, you can stand in. You can stand in the gap for them. You can pray comfort over them. But if you're in need today, I just wanna ask you to stand all around this room. I'm gonna ask the prayer team if they'll come down and join me. As we close with an opportunity, this is an invitation. Come, lay your burdens down. Receive the comfort that only God can give. Allow God to do a work in your heart like the precious balm of Gilead. Allow him to apply that on the hurting place. Allow him to apply that on the spot of pain, upon the question why. Allow God to comfort you in the questions of how did I end up here in life. Allow God to do the perfect work that only he can do. As they sing, I'm gonna invite you to come. Let's lay down our burdens together.
that he had to bring that to this house today. Let's give Pastor Joe a hand. The altar never closes. If you need time to pray afterwards, it is here. The Holy Spirit never closes. He's there for you. Cry out to God. Thank you so much for that. Like he said, if it's not relatable now, it will be in the future. Tuck that away. Remember it. Store it in your heart. Let it guide you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your rod. Thank you for your staff. Lord, your spirit knows when we need it. Lord, you are gentle. You are gracious. You pursue after us, Lord. 
Lord, we're thankful for your spirit as it guides us. We're thankful for your love as you allow us time to lament in you. Lord, we know it will not be easy, but you will be there with us through it. Thank you that you are a good, good father. Lord, as we walk out through these doors, help us throw up our hands and praise you regardless of the circumstance that we're in right now, Lord, that you are with us. As Pastor Joe said, regardless of the shadow, Lord, we are thankful that you go through the valley and you provide the green pastures. The green pastures that look different to each one of us, you know that, you know our hearts, you know our hearts' desires, you know our needs. You know the marriages that are going through a shadow right now. The parents that feel like they're going through a shadow right now. But we pray your light shine, your light guide us. We love you, we praise you, we're thankful for you. It's in your name we pray, amen. God bless you, we love you, you are dismissed.